can't tell you how grateful I am that you're tuning in to Transforming Truth. The message that you're about to hear is from a recent series on the life of Queen Esther, that wonderful, beautiful Jewish woman of ancient history who rose to a prominent position in the kingdom for a God-appointed time and season. So let's get into the Word of God together. Let's talk about Esther and the invisible God who is working powerfully in her life, just like I believe He's working in your life today. I want to bring you a message tonight called Born Beautiful. And this is where we're introduced to Esther and a countless number of other beautiful women who go nameless in chapter 2 of the book of Esther. So let me read the first nine verses. The Bible says that after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them. And let the young, women who young woman who pleases the king, let her be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now, there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem uh, among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther. Hadassah is her Hebrew name. Esther is her Persian name. Uh, Esther is the daughter of his uncle, so it's Mordecai's cousin, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So, when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in the charge, or excuse me, custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, he advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. That is kind of almost like the most boring section of Scripture you've probably read all week. Y'all are thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> what are you going to do with this passage of Scripture? Listen, this is so important because ultimately the story of Esther is not just about God elevating a, a woman. It is really about the invisible, sovereign presence and activity of God on behalf of that young woman. Before we get into the message tonight, let me just give you this. Esther has no clue that God is setting her up to be the eventual human instrument who rescues the Jews from a Persian holocaust. She has no clue. Do you know what she is right now? She is among the prettiest women in all of the provinces of Persia who has been forced in to the very first Miss Persia contest. That's exactly what she is. She has no clue that God Almighty is working in all of the pain and all of the promise of her life to bring her to a place where she intersects destiny. And every time I start talking about that, the Holy Spirit starts stirring me up. And this is, I'm hearing my voice, you're hearing my voice, but in my heart, in my mind, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit saying this, the Father's doing the exact same thing for people in this room tonight. That he's setting us up, not just the ladies, guys, you're in on this too, that he's setting us up. He's working invisibly, he's working silently, he's working imperceptibly right now through all of the mundane, normal stuff to the extent where you don't even notice that he's working, he's not revealing it to you, but you are in the midst of a divine setup in your life. So let's learn from her divine setup. Let's go back. I'm going to call the king by his other name. 
He is known historically as Xerxes, and the reason why I call him that is I have a hard time saying his name as it's written in the Bible. I may call him King A because I hate trying to say Ahasuerus. That's how you say it, but I get it wrong like 90% of the time. So we're going to go with Xerxes tonight. Same guy, different uh, form of his name. So let's start with him again. If you weren't here last week, we spent a lot of time on him, so I'm going to blow through this pretty quick. But he is a carnal king. Xerxes is the carnal king. You remember what he did last time. He threw a drunken kind of a frat party with all of his advisors, called his wife to come out wearing nothing but her crown so he could parade his woman in front of all of his drunken friends. She said no, so she was banished from the kingdom, and he basically divorced his wife on the spot. Three years have passed since chapter number one, and here we are somewhere around two and a half to three years later in chapter number two, and we find him as being a man without a wife. The Bible says this, after these things, when the anger of King A had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Now, what does it mean after these things? Here's a teaching moment. History tells us that in the three years between chapter one and chapter two, and all of that's Uh, kind of substantiated as you read later in this chapter you find out it's been three years history tells us that during those years uh, Xerxes had gone to try to go against the Grecians he had got his navy together his army together he wanted to dominate the world and he got his backside handed to him forgive me for saying it that way that's exactly what happened he amassed all of his military strength to come against the Greeks and he got defeated and so he is coming home in the midst of his great army experiencing for the very first time a sound defeating at the hands of the Greeks and guess what he's coming home to he's coming home to a palace without a wife Now, here's a man who's the most powerful man. He has a harem, so it's not about, I'm just going to be blunt here, it's not about sex. He can have sex with with whoever he wants to. But even a hardened carnal man like this is in a moment where he's walking into the palace and he's thinking about the wife that he banished by his legal decree some three years earlier, and that's what starts getting everything going again. Now, listen, he's a bad guy but God can use bad guys even to get God's sovereign will done he's not going to bless Xerxes but Xerxes is going to become an instrument of God's divine working out of destiny he's going to be an instrument in God's hand this is how it unfolds he's not only a man without a wife but watch this he's a man without a watchman what do I mean by that there's no man that cares for his soul he's got nobody guiding him it says the king's young men don't miss that The king's young men who attended on him said, and here's the advice of young men. This sounds like young guys. Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom and gather all, gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who's in charge of the women. And then he adds this footnote, let their cosmetics be given to them. Okay, first of all, I gotta slow down a little bit here so the king's looking sad and the king has an array of servants and these servants are young guys these are not his wise counselors these this is not the king's cabinet this is not his uh, people that he leans on as advisors these are just young guys who work in the palace and the young guys are there with the king and obviously they're seeing something in the king that they denote as loneliness maybe the king says something that's not recorded here so the advice of the young guys is this hey we ought to throw a miss persia palette a pageant king this is what we can do Go find all of the unmarried, young, best-looking women throughout all of the provinces in all of the empire and bring them here and put them under the custody of the guy who oversees your harem. Now, I don't want to get explicit here, but the harem is just the other women that the king can go to to satisfy himself whenever he wants. It it was so normalized back then. I'm going to come back to this. We've got some young ears in here, so discerning adults you know what I'm talking about this this these young guys say what we got to do is we got to find you a wife and so what we'll do is we will go and pick the best looking young women who've never been married they're virgins and we're going to bring them to the capital from wherever their home is and we're going to bring them here and we're going to put them in cosmetic school and training and we'll get them to look as good as they can and then you can sample them one by one until the fi- you find the one you like the most. Doesn't that sound like a strategy of hell? It just sounds like hell to me. Now, now listen, 
I hope we get this. I hope that we're not so benumbed to the way women are objectified down through the ages and in the present culture that we look at this and just kind of like, uh, because let me unpack it a minute. So there's a 16-year-old girl living 400 miles away from Susa. She happens to be gorgeous, drop-dead gorgeous. And one day, as she is maybe in the home doing domestic duties with her mother, a king's official comes to their house, says to the mother and the father, we've heard of your daughter, present her before us. They look at her. They literally look at her. They turn her around, look her up and down, look at her face, and they say, she's coming with us, and she's gone. She's taken away. She is forcibly removed from her family, from her home, and she is taken away from all that she knows under order of the king who cannot be contested, and she is taken away to the palace, or excuse me, the capital in Susa, and that is repeated over and over and over and over again. Uh, Josephus, who uh, gives us a, a, an ancient look at biblical history, said that there were some 400 women that were a part of this pageant. So 400 times, nobody asked the women what they wanted. They're girls, basically, by the way. N nobody asked their parents what they wanted. They're only sought after and valued because of their outward appearance and their potential to satisfy the carnal pleasures of King Xerxes. That's straight up the strategy of the enemy. Now, it's real easy to see that looking back in history. But, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, I don't know that we're that far removed from it in our culture today. Maybe we, we don't have that overt, forcible uh, removing. Now, I'm, I'm not even going to go down the avenue of sex trafficking and all of that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is our culture still kind of propagates this foul scent, uh, this aroma that says women are only valuable to the degree that they can please a man. And it is straight from the pit of hell. Now, go a little further with me, because what I'm talking about here is he had no watchman. What do I mean by that? He didn't have a single wise voice speaking to his life and saying, King, that's not the way to go. There, there may not have been a single man in the kingdom that would have argued with what these young fellows were presenting for the king. Let me just linger here for a second. Brothers, l l let me talk to you. Because we don't keep secrets in here. We don't pretend that, that Christian men are made out of some different material than non-Christian men. What we do have is we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we have the cooperation of God to sanctify us and bring us out of the world. We have a new nature. We are no longer what we were. We are now something completely intrinsically different. But let's, let's just remember, we're in the process of being sanctified. We are not glorified yet. And so within every man, I won't say every man because there might be one or two out there somewhere, but within every man that I know of, there is this heartbeat, this potential for a man to adopt a fallen world system and its view of what the value of a woman is. And it is thrust in our face Every single product that is being sold on television, being sold on the internet, whether it's food, whether it's beer, whether it's a car, whether it's a vacation, no matter what it is, eventually, if that kind of advertising is hitting you, you're going to see it framed up with a sensual image of a woman. Do you know why that happens that way? Because they know that most men will want the product because they'll associate it with a woman that will make them feel good about themselves. And you've got an entire marketing industry that is bent on that. Christian men, brothers, we have to be voices against this. We have to intentionally raise the bar in our own lives our own standards, our own hearts. For, for the, 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 the women that we're doing life with, we have to protect them from that kind of influence hitting them because, man, what a massive pressure and temptation it is, not for the guys just to look at it. I mean, that's bad enough. But women feel like, because they're inundated with the same stuff, that if they don't measure up to that standard, that somehow they can believe that they're less of a woman. And so the pressure to women is to conform and the pressure on men is to pounce. 
And both of those are intersecting repeatedly in our culture, and the church is just saying, well, we, we don't talk about stuff like that. Let, let's just have our little Bible study, and can you break out the flannel graph for us? And let's just, you know, and, and we, we're operating in an arena to where the only people that are informing us about sexuality and the roles of men, women and men is a fallen world system that doesn't know Christ. And because we want to stay in our little pious and religious comfort zones and let, let's talk about these things in private and let's let's or or not at all and meanwhile the problem keeps getting compounded and compounded you know what really woke me up to it it was 18 years ago when i brought a daughter home from the hospital for the first time yeah because it becomes real then uh, before that it's theory you know, I, I have absolute trust in my wife. I wasn't worried about my wife being, you know, running around on me or anything like that. But when I looked at my daughter and I recognized she's a blank slate, she, she, she has nothing written on her heart, and the entire world system wants to write falsehood about her identity all over her heart, and I have 18 years to protect her and keep her from that. This is what I'm talking about here. It's the passions of men that not only initiate this kind of view of women, but it perpetuates it too. So while men have initiated it and perpetuated it, it's time, gentlemen, for us to terminate it, to say that far and no more. And, and listen, it can't be a gripe session. It starts right here in our own hearts. By, like Job, this is not in my notes. I'm, I'm just going somewhere I feel the Lord leading me. Job said, I had to make a covenant with my eyes. Do you remember what the Bible says about Job? It says he's the most righteous man of his day. And Job, the righteous man, he won the gold medal for practical righteousness. Job said, yeah, I actually had to make a covenant with my eyes. So if you're more righteous than Job, maybe you don't need this tonight. But for the rest of us, we've got to make a covenant, guys. A covenant with the Lord over our eyes for the glory of God and the lives of his daughters. And so, listen, golly, man, I'm just going to go ahead and just sound like a fundamentalist tonight. And I just hope it helps somebody. Because we keep lowering the bar. The devil doesn't just come in with bikini-clad women and say, hey, have a good time. You know what he does? He tries to lower your standards incrementally, and he doesn't mind if it takes years. So the stuff that you would never would have looked at when you got saved, over time, he just lowers the standard a little bit over years. And before you know it, you're living a life of regular lust, and you don't even know it. Because you're not as bad as the other guy. And guys, what I'm saying is this, it robs you of power, it robs you of joy, it robs you of virtue, it robs you of, of the sense of fellowship and abiding fellowship, and you have authority over it, you have power over it, and it never satisfies a man's heart. But not only does it take from you, it devalues the daughters of God, even the ones that aren't saved, that he loves them and he created them for his glory, not our pleasure. So when we see all of this stuff going on in a microcosmic form here with, with Esther, it, it has an echo into our culture that we can't be silent about. So he's a man without a watchman. Nobody's saying anything to him. I want you to be a watchman in my life, brother. I, I want you to help me. I, I want to be a watchman in your life. Not, not hiding out in your shrubs, not saying, hey, give me your phone. I want to check your internet history. Holy Spirit sees all that anyway. You don't need me to look at that. But the reality is, is that Xerxes had nobody except a young, bunch of young men, young yes men saying, hey, it's okay. Boys will be boys. So he ended up being a man without worry. Verse 4. Their final statement was, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the Bible just says, this pleased the king, and he did so. Unregulated power, unmitigated lust. Guy was lonely. He had the authority to have any woman that he wanted in the kingdom. There was not a thing she could do about it. She resisted him. Vashti, we know what happened to her. She was banished from the kingdom. Any woman that would have resisted him prior to becoming the queen could literally be imprisoned or executed for resisting the edict of the king. But the king, he didn't have a worry in the world. He said, hey, I got these young guys egging me on. Sounds good. Let's do it. So come with me down here into verses 5 and 6 because this is where you start seeing 
God's hand moving. We see it. They didn't see it at the time, but we see it. Let's talk about Mordecai, the exiled Jew. Mordecai is the male hero of the story. Esther is the female hero of the story. Mordecai is her older cousin. So let's look a little bit at his story because you're going to find him. He, he's, he's an awesome inspiration in the story of Esther. So I hope you keep coming on Wednesday nights. But first of all, the Bible says right off the bat that Mordecai is part of an unbreakable covenant. When it calls him a Jew, he says, there was a Jew in Susa the Citadel whose name was Mordecai. Now, that's how we're introduced to him. And so when we're reading this, we recognize immediately they're in a pagan land. They're in a Gentile land. But here you have a seed of Abraham. You have Mordecai, who is a descendant of Abraham, the one God chose to be the father of faith. And so Mordecai is, is part of that community of believers to whom belong the covenants and the law and all of the inestimable privileges of what it meant to be part of God's covenant people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline myself here for time, but I, I, I want to go ahead and say this, and, and there will be people in the room that differ with me on this. Uh, I believe without any hesitation whatsoever that there is still an intentional un yet unfulfilled purpose and promises to the Jewish people today. I do not believe that God has cast them off. I understand fully that they rejected the Messiah and they crucified the Messiah. But God can't be God if he doesn't fulfill all of the promises that he made to the seed of Abraham because God would then be a liar. And so there is massive prophetic implications about what God has for the descendants of Abraham. It doesn't mean that the nation of Israel as we know it today is doing everything rightly. That's not the argument I'm making. What I'm saying is this, is God still has yet to be fulfilled promises that he made to Abraham and his descendants. And those promises will be fulfilled. And what you see over and over again, no matter how much Satan and those that serve his purposes long to exterminate the Jewish people, they're still around. Listen, do you know any Midianites? Anybody meet any Midianites lately? Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites? No, why? They're exterminated. And they came up against the Israelites over and over and just age after age after age, even into the last century, of course, with Hitler and the Holocaust. And God just continues to preserve his people. And in 1948, they come back to a land, and that is a signal flare that we are approaching the end of the age. So God will culminate with great work through Israel, and Mordecai is an ancient descendant of those very people that exist on the planet today. He's got the Abrahamic covenant. God said, I'm going to give you the land. When, when you see all the squabbling and the fighting over the land in Israel, Middle East, you say, well, who's right? Well, what do the politicians say? And what do the, what do the educators say? And, and, and you know, what, what, what do the American politicians say? And what do the people who create policy say? Well, frankly, it doesn't matter because what has God said? God has said that land belongs. And by the way, it's not just the sliver of land that they're on right now. It's much larger than that. I'm getting excited. I'm not even supposed to be preaching on Israel tonight. But. So the land belongs to them. And then you've got the Davidic covenant that promises them that there'll be a seed on the throne forever and ever and ever. And of course, that king is Jesus Christ. And Mordecai is attached to all those covenants and all of those promises. And there he is living in a terrible place that doesn't acknowledge his God. And as a matter of fact, they acknowledge lots of other gods. So he's part of this unbreakable covenant. But he's also, and this is going to come into play later, I can't really unpack it a lot tonight, but he's also part of a royal line. Verse number five at the end of it says this, says that Mordecai was the son of Jair, who was the son of Shimei, who was the son of Kish, who was a Benjamite. Now, if you're new to your Bible or you've never really studied Old Testament history, which most of us don't have to do that, but I'm a little bit of a Bible geek, and so I like this. All of these names are attached to the first king of Israel. Kish, Shimei, Jair, they're all Saul, King Saul's kindred, and they're all Mordecai's kindred. So what does that mean? Earlier, a little over a century and a half earlier, that w before the people were down in the land and taken captive, and I'll give you some of those dates here in a second, that Mordecai's people were King Saul's people. 
Mordecai is actually a descendant. His family tree goes all the way back to the first king that Israel ever had. So here he is, a Benjamite, related to Kish, who was Saul's father, and he is a man of royal heritage living in a pagan land as a captive. It speaks so much to me of how so many, I'm I'm not going to go far with this, but those who are the bloodline of Jesus Christ, not physically, but of faith, those of us that are saved, those of us that have been born again, those of us who have stepped into the new covenant through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. And when we believed and trusted, we were brought out of the domain of darkness and into the domain of light, out of the enemy status that we had before we were saved and into the family status. Listen, without trying to flatter anybody, I'm just going to make a theological statement. You are eternal royalty. That is who you are through Jesus Christ. I got one queen over here saying, you better believe it, Jeff absolutely true royalty through christ that's not supposed to make us strut but it is supposed to help us walk with confidence in in a land that wants to just kind of demean and devalue us mordecai was living in a land of captivity but he actually has royal dna in his blood so this is going to come apparent later on in the story but when we meet how many of you know the name haman from the book of esther He's the bad guy. You're going to meet him in one chapter. And what you're going to see is Haman's bloodline and Mordecai's bloodline actually intersected some 500 years before. And what happens in Esther is tied to something that King Saul failed to do. And if King Saul 500 years earlier had done one thing that he was called to do, the thing that happens in the book of Esther may never have happened. And I'll show you that here in a couple of weeks. So, yeah, I'm I'm advertising a little bit. I'm baiting you. Come back. This is a cool story. All right. He was also part of a troubled generation. Let me give you this, and then we're going to talk about Esther. I'm trying to get there. The Bible says that it was uh, his descendants that had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, and carried away with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. All right, let me give you this. I don't want to lose you here, but it's important that we understand just these quick three points on the ancient history of Israel. So Israel was the apple of God's eye. They were the chosen uh, people of God. But they rebelled against God. They killed the prophets. They got to a place where they started indulging in the sins and the practices of the surrounding nations. And the more they started worshiping these other false gods, the more their flesh was pleased. And so ultimately, and if you were here when we studied the life of Josiah, you know what I'm talking about. They were they were murdering their babies. They were engaged in all sorts of heterosexual and homosexual activity that would blow the minds of everybody in here if I thought it was proper to share the details. It was horrific. It was like you take the worst places in Vegas, the worst places in New York, the worst places in Atlanta, you swirl them all together, and that doesn't approach what was going on in ancient Israel. We're talking about the people of God when they got seduced by these other gods. So what did God do? God kept sending prophets saying, if you don't repent, I'm going to bring trouble your way. And so for a time, they would repent. We're sorry, God, we won't do that again. They went right back to it until eventually they got to a place where there was, God had said, uh, I'm done with you. I'm going to bring invaders from the north and you're going to go into a 70-year captivity because I'm going to break you of your false worship of other gods. And so Babylon came down. King Nebuchadnezzar comes down and he destroys Jerusalem. He takes the children of Israel off captive. That was around 586 B.C., And then, so the Babylonian captivity was going on. Then Cyrus, the king of Persia, come and conquers the Babylonians. And so after about 70 years of captivity, Cyrus, the Persian king, comes and conquers the Babylonians. And in about 539 B.C., he releases the Jews. So he inherits all of these Jewish captives from Babylon, and God moves on this pagan king's heart, and he says, all right, I'll tell you what you're going to do. This is during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Go back to your homeland, build the gates, build the temple. Y'all go back to your homeland. And so all of these Israelites went back, but some of them had gotten used to living in captivity. They, They got used to the food. They got used to the lifestyle. 
They got used to all of the luxury of living in captivity. Never mind that they weren't free. Never mind that they weren't living in God's designated place. They got used to it, and so they didn't go back. Mordecai's family would have been one of those families that didn't go back. Maybe even Mordecai himself. He chose to live in captivity. And so when Cyrus releases the Jews to go back to their homeland and start entering in again in covenant with the Lord, by the way, Israel has never had a problem worshiping other gods since that time. God sent them into captivity. He brought the hammer down on them to break them of their spiritual adultery. And when he released them back in the land, they were from that point forward to this very day what we call a monotheistic people. That means they know ain't no other gods but God. How many of you know that when you get off track and you start chasing other things in life, that God doesn't mind bringing down the hammer just to let you know he's God. Amen? That'll scare some of you hyper-grace people, but it is biblical. And it's it's not because he's mean. It's because he loves you. And by the way, he's a jealous God. He doesn't want you worshiping anything else for two reasons. One, because he's glorious and he will not share that glory with another. But number two, anything else you worship is worse for you. So he doesn't want you worshiping other things or chasing other things, not only because it's, it, it infringes upon his glory, but it's terrible for your soul. And so God brought the discipline down on them. He still does it today. And so here we are with Mordecai, 55 years after his people were allowed to go back to the homeland. Here is Mordecai, this exiled Jew, but it is an awesome thing that he's there because now I'm going to introduce you to his younger cousin, And her name is Esther. And the rest of the story is about Mordecai, Esther, and Haman. And let me tell you, it is a rocking good story. You're going to love this thing. So last few points here. Here's Esther, the beauty queen. Three characters tonight. Xerxes, the carnal king, Mordecai, the exiled Jew, and Esther, the beauty queen. So let's talk about this. First of all, this is a young woman. We don't know how old she is, but she's young. She's broken in her circumstances. Look what the Bible says about her. Mordecai was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. So this is a girl that's had a difficult life. She was born in captivity there in the Persian area, probably near the capital. And somewhere after her birth, her mother and her father die. So they died in captivity And there she is at some point. She may have been a young child. She may have been a teenager. We don't know. But she is an orphan. So she has neither mother. She has neither father. But she does have um, a very committed and compassionate older cousin named Mordecai who takes her in. It's an awesome thing that in, in God's providence of Esther's destiny, part of it, listen to me on this. Part of it involved a few chapters of pain, that that she experienced loss. Please remain realistic about this thing called the, the journey of faith. The journey of faith is not, as some would have us believe, always easy. It's, it's not chapter after chapter of endless pleasure. During this lifetime where we're walking by faith, you and I are going to experience some losses, some pains. There's going to be some confusing confusing seasons. Um, Right now, I'm thinking about a good friend of mine that that died yesterday. And his battle, he's, he's just six months older than me. And my heart sank when I heard because I know that his precious wife, and all of them love Jesus, and his two daughters, and they're hurting deeply tonight. But their confidence is not in having ceaseless chapters of ease. Their confidence is is that the one who saved them will also accompany them through those difficult chapters. And so we've got to remember that. Unfortunately, we bury people. We lose people. There are times where our our dreams externally um, can rise and then crash because of things far beyond our control. But the question that we all have to remain Um, centered in is this is God there in the midst with you that is the bedrock that no matter what is going on externally that internally you are not alone you are not forsaken and nothing big that happens to you on the outside is bigger than the God who lives on the inside and those aren't cliches that's theology 
That's truth. It's simply phrased tonight, but it's theology. And so he entrusted some difficulty to Esther. Uh, It is highly likely that the outcome of the book of Esther that benefited the entire Jewish population in the Persian Empire, it would have been very different had Mordecai not been the one who was raising and influencing Esther. Because you're going to find out later in this study just how intentional he is about challenging her to remain in her destiny. So she's broken in her circumstances, but let's get to the, the gist of it. She's beautiful in her appearance. Let's just let the Bible say what it says. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. That's that's your Bible. There's nothing wrong with it. I think it's really important here that we just get get some, some balance, some centering when it comes to this issue of physical beauty. Because the pendulum has swung so far in a very sexualized culture that we live in, It could be possible that we might look at beauty, God-given physical beauty. I'm not talking about sensual or seductive-looking beauty. I'm talking about natural God-given beauty and the normal bounds of, of, of looking good. We might be tempted to think that there's something wrong with that or something unspiritual. There's certain denominations in Christendom that literally teach that a woman should look as plain as possible because that will make her as spiritual as possible. And obviously that's not, that's not founded in Scripture, but they misappropriate what Peter taught about a woman not overemphasizing her hair and her jewelry and her makeup, and rather let her cultivate a meek and quiet spirit. So they took that to the extreme, meaning just work on the inside of you and try to make the outside of you as repulsive as possible. And that seems to be the takeaway from it. That's, that's, not the, that's not the gospel. I'm just going to state some things, male and female. God makes some people beautiful, some people average, and some people plain. That's truth. Some people are made by God beautifully. Some are made average looking, and some are made plain. It has nothing to do with a person's value, nothing. It is simply the outward. By the way, we're all getting a new robe of flesh one day. We're getting a glorified body one day. So the way you look now is not the way you're going to look forever. That's good news for a lot of us, amen. I'm going to be tall. I'm going to have a six-pack, amen. It's going to be awesome. Full head of hair, it's going to be great. Until then, we press on by faith, amen. My point being is this. um, The Bible does say that beauty is vain. It's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last. I mean, there, are, there are, can be prolonged seasons where a woman is beautiful. But I, I'm, I'm not even trying to be funny here. But time and gravity ruin that. Just ruins it. And so if a woman's identity is in what she sees in the mirror, then the clock is ticking on her identity. But if a woman's identity is in what God says about her, then she can look in the mirror, she can work with what she's been granted, but she can keep on moving into her destiny because that's incidental and not crucial, what she sees in the mirror. And so this young lady, Esther, the Bible says that she had a pretty face, and I'm not being ugly here, and she had a nice figure. She had a good body, and she had a nice face. That's what's in the scripture. It's very interesting to me that um, God actually used this as part of her destiny trajectory. The Bible doesn't say anything beforehand about any of her qualities, any of her inner. This is the only thing we're told initially about Esther. We're told that she lost her parents, and we're told that she is beautiful in her appearance. So let me just give a quick commentary on this. Um, I think we should appreciate beauty. Um, I think that outward beauty, physical attractiveness, it's, it's an old cliche, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If you feel that you are not one of the beautiful ones, maybe you feel you're not even one of the average ones. Maybe you just think I'm kind of one of the plain ones. Let me give you some good news, especially if you're single and, and you wrestle with that. Do you know that if you're single, my sister, that God only has one guy that you got to look good to? There's only one guy out there. 
you, you don't need a hundred guys to think you are the you know smoking hot woman that's that's not what you need matter of fact that's trouble <laughs> All you need is, and there's only one dude out there, and the one guy that God has for you is going to think you look great. He is going to like what he sees. But our culture says that you have to look a certain way. You have to be a certain size. You have to have a certain type of hair, a certain type of skin, a certain type of facial features. And all of that stuff's a joke anyway, because you know they airbrush all of that stuff, Amen. <laughs> They nip, they tuck, and they airbrush that stuff. And even then, check back in with that lady, nipped and tucked and airbrushed. In 25 years, it's not going to register the same. And yet our culture says, go after that. That's where your value is. And, and it's just, it bombards the female American, not just American, the Western mindset. It, it so tries to thrust upon you a sense of value based on what you see. What we find in scripture is, is very simple. It's incidental. It's incidental. Some are called beautiful, but they're very few and far between. It's a sad thing to live for. And I, I pray that I pray that the daughters of God will so grow in their relationship that they can be delivered from obsessing over their appearance and they don't feel like they have to enter into an expectation of a fallen seductive culture in order to feel valuable to what? To some man that wants to objectify you? Come on. When you cultivate the spirit, listen, for Christian women, Mr. Right is looking for one thing, Miss Right. And he's not even going to want that seductive, that alluring kind of over-the-top sensualized look. That's not what the man that you need is going to be looking for anyway. You, you, listen, God help me. I, I feel like I'm, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that, Ed. Edward's on the front row, so preach it, brother. You know, I feel like I'm preaching this on behalf of my daughter's generation. We've got women in here that are in their teens and in their 20s, and, and I just know the pressure hits you. It's, it's a lie. It's all deception. It is a lie, but it's coming at you hard and fast and constant. And so you have to take ownership over what you allow to start making you feel either valued or devalued. And I'm going to tell you something. You've got to know your value before you find that man because that man cannot give you your full identity and your full value. You've got to know who you are in the Lord. And when you start really knowing who you are in the Lord and believing it, then you're going to be okay. You, you, it doesn't mean you still won't want to share your life with somebody and it gets hard. I'm not, I'm not being flippant or you know, making light of the fact of, of wanting to share your life with somebody. But, um, you know, there's, there's something worse than being single, being married to the wrong person, because you got impatient. So I'm going to bill y'all for the premarital counseling, and you can send it by uh, check. She's beautiful in her appearance. She's beautiful in her appearance. Just let it rest for that. It's a statement of fact. It is not a statement of value. Esther was pretty, and God was going to use that. So... She was also beloved by her cousin, very simply, I'm almost out of time. Her father and mother died. Mordecai took her as his own daughter. I love that, man. I love that. She was robbed of her physical parents. But God said, hey, I'm, I'm not going to leave you like that. I've got one who's going to look after you. And hallelujah, thank God for Mordecai. A guy that was willing to, you know, we don't read anything else about his, his, his wife or his kids, we don't know that he had any family, but what it, whether he did or he didn't, he looked at a helpless one and he said, instead of merchandising her, I'm going to be her protector. Instead of entering into this Babylonian system, I'm actually, or excuse me, this Persian system, I'm actually going to, and we're, we'll see this through the rest of the chapters, I'm actually going to protect her. I'm going to remind her of who she is, and then it is Mordecai that calls the gold out of her in a couple of chapters. He is an awesome 
dude. And so she's broken in her circumstances. She's beautiful in her appearance. She is beloved by her cousin. And then lastly, verses 8 and 9, she's blessed with favor. The Bible says when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly, you're talking about Haggai there, not the king. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women in the king's palace. And, and Haggai advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Okay, that doesn't sound all that great to you, but considering the situation, what we see is that God, again, invisibly and silently was orchestrating things. When, when you hear of her having favor, that is, that's, that's a spiritual term, and that favor has got to be sourced in something. So just picture the scene. Esther and let's just say hundreds of other women are now brought to the capital. They are, for the next several months, even up to a year, are going to be being prepared to spend the night with the king. It is a um, sensual audition that all of them have to go through, and only one of them is going to be the queen. Every other one of them will be put back in the harem. She may get an occasional visit from the king later on down the road, but only one is going to be the wife. All of the other women are objectified, used, and tossed in the harem. Listen, I want you to just wrap your mind around that. This is the kind of stuff that goes on in a culture where the church is silent or non-existent. If you go to other parts of the world where the gospel does not have a pervasive influence, you are going to find women treated in the exact same manner. So when your uninformed friends say they don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because it suppresses women, don't get hysterical, get historical. And let them know, whoa, 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 whoa. Anywhere you go in the world today where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not made inroads, you go there and see how women are treated. Why? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the equalizer between the gender treatment. It's the equalizer. Jesus gives equal status in the kingdom to men and women. Different roles, different functions. I know that. But equal value. In any culture where the gospel is absent, men win because men are stronger and more aggressive. That's just the way it is. And men can dominate physically. And then when systems are built on male dominance, you have a substructure that exists in those nations and those lands where the women are victimized perpetually from girlhood all the way up until they're discarded as old women. We see little traces of this in what we read tonight. One of those women is going to become the queen, and that woman is Esther. It is because God gave her favor and the protective covenant that's over her as a Jewess is being uh, seen in this thing. We'll, we'll hit it next week. I'm just going to leave the rest of it for next week. But the idea... Lord, help me end this wisely. The idea that these young women, teenagers more than likely, are stripped from their homes. Some of them may have gone willingly. Some of them may have said, oh, I, I'm going to be the queen. Some of them may have wanted it. Most of them probably didn't. It would have been terrifying. And they're thrust into a harem, and they're told what their job's going to be. You're going to get one shot one night with the king, and you better do your best to please him. And we're going to train you for a year, and we're going to give you all of the cosmetics and all of the training, and you're going to get one shot at it, and one of you is going to be the queen. I cannot imagine the plummeting of that woman, all of those women, the plummeting of their heart to know that they had one shot to sensually please a man they had never met who was twice their age. He's, he's a middle-aged guy at this point. And if they weren't picked, 
they're lumped into the harem with all of the other discards. That's what the enemy does. He devalues and he discards. Jesus Christ is the exact opposite. He goes to those that have been discarded by this world, those that have been rejected, those that are found unimpressive, unlovely, and unwanted in this world. And the Lord Jesus Christ moves intentionally towards all, male and female in those categories. And he says, I love broken things. I love bruised people. I love those that the world rejects and will not love. I love the forgotten and the refused. And anybody that'll say yes to him has a companion for life and after life. That's the king that we serve. Not like King Xerxes, but an entirely different realm. So next week, we'll go a little bit further into the story and we'll begin to see God really powerfully move. Can we stand together tonight?